Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Vatican Observatory Foundation. During the last week in September 2023, the Vatican Observatory Foundation held a three-day-long celebration of the 30th anniversary of the first light into the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, or VAT for short. The VAT's 1.8-meter mirror was one of the first created using the simply fantastic spin-casting method. Many modern telescopes also use this method for their mirrors. The audio for this podcast comes from a recording made on Friday, September 29, 2023, during the first day of the VAT's 30th anniversary gala. In front of an audience, Brother Guy Consolmagno, Director of the Vatican Observatory and President of the Vatican Observatory Foundation, spoke to our special guest, Marine Corps Major General, Shuttle Astronaut, and former NASA Administrator Charles F. Bolden, Jr., I'm your co-host, Bob Tremblay. I'm the president of Michigan's Warren Astronomical Society, a volunteer NASA JPL solar system ambassador, and an internet factotum for the Vatican Observatory Foundation. Before listening to this discussion, I really didn't know very much about Charles Bolden Jr., except that he was the unlucky NASA administrator who in 2013, after the Chelyabinsk impact event, told Congress that our asteroid defense capabilities were insufficient. I am thrilled that things have changed since then. Now, after listening to him speak with Brother Guy, it's nearly impossible not to feel a great sense of admiration for the man. Wow, I've been looking forward to this stuff. Yes, have I. And I made sure that you sat on the other end of the table so I wouldn't, you know, I can't speak. You wouldn't talk to me. You wouldn't talk to me the the whole (laughs) up until now. You need to mention some people we knew in college. We did. We've all read the, the, the biography. We've seen you know, all the incredible things you've done as a pilot, as a head of NASA. I would say probably nobody in this room really aspires to be the head of NASA, except maybe Mark Sykes. Did he ever show up? <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that we all really want to know is, what's it like to be in space? Can you tell us what it was like the first time you got into space? Um, the word that I, it's, it's, um, it's an old word, and, and I have not been able to find one that adequately describes it, but it's awesome. So let me start with that. Um, I was incredibly well prepared for my first flight, uh, technically. I was totally unprepared emotionally uh, for what I experienced. And we had been through four uh, countdowns and, and cancellations before we finally launched on our fifth attempt. We were scheduled to launch in sometime in 1985 and launched on the, um, the 12th of January in 1986. And um, when you lift off from the Kennedy Space Center, you've been laying in the vehicle for about two hours or so on your back, just waiting for the ground to finish all the checks and everything. And you can hear everything going on. So the first time we went out, we got down to 14 seconds and they, the clock stopped and we knew something wasn't right. Um, that time it turned out that they, uh, they thought that there was a problem with one of the solid rocket boosters, which are the big rockets on the side of the shuttle. So we did what they call scrub, um, and they rolled the vehicle back to the vehicle assembly building, which sent us home for Christmas. And we trained more, and then we came back on the 3rd of January to get ready to fly and went out the next time, and the clock went down to 14 seconds and stopped again. <laughs> um, this time it was a problem with one of the main engines. And we went out the third time and the clock stopped at 31 seconds. Turned out to be fortuitous because with the previous cancellation it was a problem with getting liquid oxygen um, into the vehicle from the storage facility at the Kennedy Space Center. And when they defueled the vehicle, they broke one of the probes. Um, that, and, it, and the probe lodged itself in a valve that that was supposed to close before you launch. If we had launched that day, we would not have made it to space because we would have drained a lot of the liquid oxygen out and we would not have had enough propellant to go. So God watches over babies and fools. I mean, I've, always, <laughs> I've always believed it. The fourth time we went out, everything was perfect except the weather. And we lay there for a couple of hours listening to the lightning and thunder and everything around the pad. And we had asked the night before, why are we going out? The weatherman says, we are not going to be able to launch tomorrow, so why don't we just 
give people a day off, and they said, no, we've got to try. And we went, okay, we'll do that. And so we went out and suited up and got in the vehicle and lay there until finally we started talking about all this lightning we were hearing, and the folk in Houston said, okay, let's get them out. So we came out and went back out the next day for launch attempt number five, and we were so certain we were not going to launch <laughs> that, uh, that several of my crew members had unstrapped. Uh, which is a no-no. And, um, and as we came out of this, they have these different holes in the countdown so that the ground can make sure everything's okay. We came out of the final hold at T-minus nine minutes, and uh, they said, okay, we're getting ready to come out of the hole, and we went, oh, gee. <laughs> so we had people scrambling to get strapped back in and everything, and the countdown went without a hitch, and we launched, and um, that was the beginning of a journey that I shall never forget because the vehicle's just... You know, you're laying there on your back and all of a sudden you can hear the three main engines and you can feel them because they kind of go and the vehicle just kind of shakes and it literally moves like this It's because it's attached by the two solid rocket boosters to the launch pad. They're, they're eight bolts that hold you up and the engines are off center so they push the vehicle until the boats just can't go anymore and it snaps back. and that, We call it the twang. And, and the twang takes about seven seconds. So the main engines ignite seven sections, seven sections, seven seconds before liftoff. We did the twang, came back here, and go boom. This big explosion as the two solid rocket boosters ignited and the vehicle just went boom. And you're vibrating and everything and you had not, our simulators are really good we don't have a way to simulate that violent um, eruption of power and everything. And unlike the Apollo vehicles that took forever to get off, shuttle just leapt off the pad. And uh, you know, you do a roll to make sure that the vehicle can control itself the ground. We call to the ground that we're in the roll program. They want, they want to hear that call and that makes them comfortable that things are working right. And about 15 minutes after leaving the Kennedy Space Center, um, I looked out the window because the solid rocket boosters had separated about two minutes. Uh, it got really smooth. It went from shaking and vibrating to feeling like you were in the most comfortable limousine you'd ever been in on the smoothest highway you've ever been on. I mean, it's just, just a wonderful, comfortable ride. About it, the engines burned for about eight and a half minutes, and that accelerates you to 17,500 miles an hour. In the last 45 seconds or so, the vehicle has lost most of its weight. So the fuel has burned off. The two solid rocket boosters that were about 2 million pounds of weight have separated. And you've got this million and a half pounds of thrust pushing up. It's essentially a 200,000 pound vehicle into space. And we throttle the engines back as far as we safely can so that the crew only feels about three times the force of gravity on your chest. Feels like you have a couple of gorillas sitting on your chest, <laughs> but you just kind of run it out for the last 45 seconds or so. And then the main engine's cut off, and you're essentially in space. You've still got to do another burn that puts you in a circular orbit from this giant egg-shaped orbit. But about 15 minutes into, into, the, into the flight, I was able to raise my seat up, and I looked out the front window, and I could tell that we were going over the British Isles, and I saw what I thought was this island. Um, and then I said, eh, can't be an island. It was a continent of Africa. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and I, I literally, I'm a very emotional person. You will see that tonight. I cry at the drop of a hat. So I'm sort of an unusual Marine. Um, <laughs> but my dad taught me to cry. He was my high school football coach. And he hated to lose. And whenever we lost a football game, he said, OK, cry and get it over. And that's not good. <laughs> so I realized it was a continent of Africa. And being a person of, of African descent, I had studied African geology, geography, not geology, geography for the year before my flight because I wanted to be able to look and see some of the West, West African countries from where my ancestors may have come. I looked out the window and I have no idea why a person who's 39 years old, um, you know, has seen a lot of stuff, why I expected that I was going to look down here and see lines <laughs> on, on the continent of Africa that were going to define the countries, but I really did. And when I looked out the window, the beauty and the magnificence of the planet 
was just breathtaking. And there were no lines or anything. And I literally cried, but immediately I said, you know, all this stuff I've been taught all my life about differences in people and about differences in countries we created between this year and that year. And I realized that, no, that's not the way God intended it to be. This is the way that God created this planet and other places. And so 15 minutes into my first plight, flight, I decided that you know my plight in life was to try to come back and help educate, educate people that we're all the same and, uh, and that we can do better than we're doing to make the planet that way. So long, long answer to your short question. Great, great, man. long answer. You mentioned your cat. Yes. You can skip all the applause stuff because he'll have more time to ask questions. And, and also, I'm a, I'm a person who suffers from the imposter syndrome. Uh, for those of you who may not know what the imposter syndrome is, it's I go through life wondering, why me? What the heck am I doing here? Um, because I don't deserve to be here and I, I appreciate it and it will never change. So I understand that, but, but you don't, you know, I don't know. There, there, there's a Jesuit version of the imposter syndrome, yeah. which is, boy, am I faking it, and when they find out, they're going to be well, so you're embarrassed. Always, you're, always <laughs> worried, you're always worried about getting caught. <laughs> and so if we took the beak and you're caught, right? I'm fooling them. They're the ones that are going to get caught. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you mentioned you know, all these different things. I'm trying to put together a timeline. Yeah. So let's go back to when you were in grade school, when you were yeah. in high school. What, what years are we talking about? We're Where talking about the fifth, the... Uh, 50s through, I graduated from high school in 1964 okay. in Columbia, South Carolina. So I lived through the Jim Crow South. I was born in 1946. My mom and dad uh, graduated from Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina, a historically black college, which was a Presbyterian college at the time. And so my mom and my mother, who was a cradle-born Episcopalian, when she decided to marry my dad, and they were high school sweethearts. She had been the queen and he was the star football player, and uh, typical. Um, and my wife's mother and father had gone to Benedict College in Columbia in our hometown, a Baptist college. But my, my father and her father had played football together in high school. And so our families knew each other. We were, I mean, that was not atypical of black families in those days because, you know, you came together socially uh, for the benefit of the kids, to be quite honest. And so we knew each other. I fell in love with my 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 to be wife when we were in kindergarten together. <laughs> and uh, but I was a little kid. I was a shrimp. I, I I weighed 84 pounds, and I think I was four feet 11 when I got to ninth grade. And um, and I went out for the football team. Uh, my father was my high school football coach, and my mother just dreaded it. Um, but I. I broke my arm the first year, so I was the trainer for the team, and my mother thought that would be the end of that, but then the next year, um, everything was all healed, and I went out again, and ended up being the second string quarterback for my dad, and um, he was tough, but eminently fair, and uh, never played a game at home, because he understood how mean the fans could be, you know, to my mother, sitting in the stands if I did something wrong, so I never played at home. In, in my entire high school career. But he was my inspiration. My mother was my middle school librarian. And um, so I was an insatiable reader growing up. Um, they demanded of my brother and me only a few things. One was that we believed we could do anything we wanted to do if we were willing to study and work hard. And, um, and that we understand that where we lived and how we lived was not really the way that things should be and that we needed to work to make it better as we grew up. So my mom and dad were my first and still role models, although they're looking down on us. When you were in high school, were you thinking you were going to be an astronaut? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, when I was in high school, the only thing I was thinking about other than my wife, Jackie, my, my to-be wife, my wife, and she didn't have the time of day for me uh, because I was this little short, shrimpy person and she was gorgeous. Um, but I had seen a program on television called Men of Annapolis when I was 12 years old that was about life at the Naval Academy. When I was growing up, television was full of military 
programs and stuff. It was big back then. People appreciated the military. And I fell in love with the Naval Academy from a television program when I was 12. And I decided that's where I want to go to school. And so when I, I got to high school, I knew how you get to the Naval Academy. You had to get a congressional appointment or every single, and you all need to keep this in mind for those of you who are parents or grandparents, every single kid in the U.S. is eligible for a vice presidential appointment. Vice president has the power when it comes to going to service academies. Everybody else can only appoint from their congressional district or their state. The president is only can only appoint people who are sons and daughters of Medal of Honor winners or active duty military. The vice president can appoint anybody who is an American citizen. And so I knew that, and the vice president at the time was Lyndon Johnson. And uh, so I wrote to Lyndon Johnson from my ninth grade on saying, I really want to go to the Naval Academy. And I'd get a letter back, you know, my, my South Carolina delegation, Strom Thurmond being the, the senior <laughs> senator, made it very clear that there was no way they were going to appoint a black to the Naval Academy, to any academy. Um, so I said, okay, I got it. And um, so I was counting on Lyndon Johnson. And then my senior year in high school, um, November 22nd, we were on our way to Charleston, South Carolina, to play for the, the state championship. And we got word that President Kennedy had been assassinated. And so my world came to a crushing end almost because I knew that the vice president was going to become president and he was not going to be able to help me. Um, and my mom knew that and she said, are you going to give up? This was my mom. I said, I don't, what do you mean? I don't know what to do. She said, figure it out. So I dragged out a typewriter and I typed out a letter to the President of the United States and I said, this is me again. <laughs> Same guy from three years ago and I really want to go to the Naval Academy. And I know I'm not eligible for a presidential appointment, but I really want to go to the Naval Academy. Never heard from President Johnson, but a couple of weeks later, a Navy recruiter showed up at my front door and said, asked for me and said, I understand, you know, you want to go to the Naval Academy. Several months later, President Johnson sent a retired federal judge, Judge Bennett, from Washington, D.C., around the country looking for qualified young, young men of color. Women weren't allowed in the academies at the time. And, um, and I ended up getting an appointment from Congressman William Dawson in Chicago, Illinois. So that's how I got to the Naval Academy. Had an address in Chicago and everything else, you know. A uh, good way to start your career on integrity. <laughs> but, at, but at the time, I didn't think about that. I got to vote twice. I got, I got to go. And, you got to vote twice. Yeah. In Chicago. Yeah. So that's how I got to the Naval Academy, and it was my mom's inspiration and encouragement. I do have to break away just to talk from my own story. Yeah. My dad desperately wanted to go to the Naval Academy uh -huh. because he wanted to fly in Zeppelins. <laughs> this is how long ago that was. And worked desperately to get the uh, Frank guy elected from Boston. Being Italian, we were not Democrats; we were Republicans. Republicans. My mom and dad were Republicans. Growing not, up. not a whole lot of Republicans were elected from Boston in 1936. <laughs> <laughs> so he never made it to the Naval Academy. He would have been class of 40. Probably would not have lived to see 43. So that works in odd ways. But you made it. I did. So. When you got to the Naval Academy, um, there were probably not a whole lot of other black guys. There were seven of us in my class um, of about 1,400, and um, we had uh, three first classmen, seniors, Paul Reason, Stan Carter, and Floyd Grayson. Paul Reason eventually, ultimately became the vice chief of naval operations, uh, was a submariner now. Stan Carter, uh, and Paul's the only one still living, but, but Stan Carter was a... a a Navy sailor, and Floyd did his five years and became a very successful realtor and developer in Columbia, Maryland. And then the junior class had none, the class of 66. Class of 67 had two. Uh, one guy by the name of Cal Huey, who was a phenomenal wide receiver for Navy's football team. Uh, he had played with Roger Staubach and, and was one of Staubach's big targets. Um, Roger Staubach was a first, he was a senior when I was a plebe, and, and he saved me once at the Naval Academy when I got lost in the hall, <laughs> and uh, he snatched me into his room and asked me what I was doing there, and, uh, and he helped to get me back to the right place and all that stuff, but there weren't a lot. The seven of us went down to six before plebe summer ended, and then down to five 
uh, when Emerson Carr eventually graduated in the class of 69, was a football player, a very good football player, decided he wanted to go back to Minnesota and play at the University of Minnesota and changed his mind after spring training and said, no, I want to be back at the Naval Academy and came back the next year. And then Jimmy Frizzell was another football player who ended up just couldn't handle the academics. So we were down to four and the four of us stayed um, and graduated together and uh, three of us are still living and um, so it was great. How did you become an aviator? Uh, two things I was not going to do when I graduated from high school I, and I've, I've told people this before. I was not going to fly airplanes because that was inherently dangerous. And I used to, I used to tell people, my mother, I, I used to use the phrase, I said, my mother did not raise a fool. <laughs> and so I was not going to fly airplanes. I had no desire to do that. And the other thing was I was not going to become a Marine. I thought Marines were crazy. Um, you know, I live, living in Columbia, which is right in the middle of the state, if you've been there, uh, Paris Island was an hour and a half, two hours away. Charleston, all the naval bases were two hours away. And uh, Fort Jackson, the largest basic training center in the world at the time, was right there in Columbia. And then we had Shaw Air Force Base. And so on the weekends, all the servicemen came to Columbia to the one black park in the city, which had an Olympic-sized pool and everything, Drew Park, named for Dr. Charles Drew, the father of the blood bank. And, and they would just decimate <laughs> Usually because Marines started all this stuff and I said, don't want to be don't want to have anything to do with the Marine Corps. My very first company officer at the Naval Academy was a Marine by the name of Major John Riley Love, an infantry officer um, who was in his last year there, had been a Vietnam veteran, and he was like my dad, unbelievably tough but eminently fair. And um, he helped me get through plebe year. And four years later when it was time to graduate, I looked back and I said, I want to be like him. And so I decided I was gonna be a Marine. Nobody in my family, like, my dad cried like a baby. <laughs> I told them, I informed them at the Army-Navy game in Philadelphia my senior year. My dad cried, my mom cried, my soon-to-be wife, Jackie, cried. And they said, you know, you can't do this. I, I, you know, the Tet Offensive had just occurred earlier in the year. And the life expectancy of, they thought of the life ex expectancy of second lieutenants in the Marine Corps at the time in months, or if not weeks. And I said, no, this is what I want to do. And everybody said, okay, we're not happy, but it's your choice. I went to the basic school, six month course of study, uh, thinking I was going to be an infantry officer. Our three day war, uh, the graduation exercise was the end of November, first day of December, bitter cold, snow and ice on the ground, and I thought I would die. <laughs> Uh, I didn't sleep for three days. Was this? I, this was Quantico, Virginia. Okay. And I volunteered for all the fire watches so I would not have to sleep. <laughs> and uh, I had given away, I had an aviation option out of the Naval Academy, and I had gone in and told my company officer that I didn't want to do that. that I, they could take it and give it to somebody else. And um, so I went back in after the three-day war, and I went in and walked into Major McElroy's office. I said, sir, I changed my mind. <laughs> I think I'm going to Pensacola. And uh, so I headed off to Pensacola with... with my wife Jackie, and first time I got in an airplane, I fell in love with it, contrary to what I thought. Still no desire to be an astronaut, no thoughts of the space program. We had followed the space program with great interest. We Actually, I was in Meridian, Mississippi in training when we walked on the moon the first time, and I was mesmerized by it, but no interest whatsoever in getting into the space program. But I did decide I wanted to be a test pilot. Um, so I went from not wanting to fly to wanting to be a test pilot because one of my, again, person influenced me. My, one of my primary flight instructors in Kingsville, Texas, where I got my wings, was a guy by the name of Pete Field, a major in the Marine Corps who was a test pilot. And he talked, every time we flew together, he talked about the fact that it's not a, you know, scarf hanging out of uh, out the dog on the cockpit. It's really tough, it's very demanding, and it's very precise. For me, that was exactly what I wanted to do. And so I started applying to test pilot school when I graduated. And it took me about three years to finally get accepted. I had gone to Vietnam, come back, was a recruiter in Los Angeles, went to grad school at the University of Southern California, and got a master's degree. And I applied. I said, OK, I'm going to apply one more time. And if I don't get it, God's telling me, forget it. And I got selected to go to test pilot school. So we went back. And at the same time that I was doing that, NASA selected the first group of space shuttle astronauts. And I watched it with interest, but not interest because I wanted to do that. I was just interested. And three people selected in that class were black, 
uh, Ron McNair, Guy Bluford, and Fred Gregory. This is Six about, women. This is about 1970. That was 78. That was the first class of astronauts selected specifically to fly this vehicle that we didn't even have yet. They were selected to fly the shuttle. The 35 new guys, there were 35 of them, six women, three blacks. And, um, you know, I just, I kind of, I said, yeah, that, that's nice that that's happening. And I went off and did my test pilot stuff. But then uh, in June of my first year there in Pax River, four airplanes came in from Houston, sleek looking white supersonic NASA T-38s uh, with eight of the members of the first class of space shuttle astronauts. And I saw this black guy get out of the back seat of one of them. And I recognized him as Ron McNair, Dr. Ron. I call him the late, great Dr. Ron McNair because we lost him on Challenger. Ron had grown up about 42 miles from me in South Carolina, a place called Lake City, about as big as this room when he was growing up. Um, his mom had been a teacher like my parents. Uh, but Ron had always wanted to be an astronaut. He went to MIT on encouragement from a professor there uh, after graduating with honors from ANT, historically black college in Greensboro, North Carolina in physics, went to MIT and earned a PhD in laser physics and went to work for Hughes Aircraft and then applied for the space program to fulfill his life's dream. And he was selected in that first group. And so I saw Ron get out of the back of this airplane and I rushed over to him and, and introduced myself and we spent the weekend talking when I took him back to go back to Houston, he said, hey, are you gonna apply for the space program? I said, not on your life. <laughs> and he was incredulous. Uh, it was incredible. <laughs> so he said, why not? I said, Ron, they never picked me. And he looked, he paused a moment and he looked me right back. He said, you know, that is the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> I said, how do you know if you don't ask? And what happened was he embarrassed me more than anything else because my mom and dad had raised me to believe, my brother and me, to believe in ourselves and to believe we could overcome any obstacles if we were willing to work for it. And I'd forgotten that. And um, so Ron got in his airplane, they went back to Houston, I went home and I told my wife Jack, I said, you know, I, I don't stand a, excuse my language, I don't stand a snowball's chance in hell of being selected, but I owe it to myself to apply because I don't want to look back years from now and say what would have happened had I applied. And so I put my application in. Um, much to my surprise, I was invited to come to Houston to interview and um, spent a week in Houston going through physical and psychological and all kinds of tests. But the good thing was we had free run of the Johnson Space Center and the astronaut office and got a chance to play on the astronaut office softball team and go to play racquetball, did all the things that astronauts did. And I, I just, I said, boy, this would be phenomenal. Went back home. We were at, um, in Patuxent River, Maryland, and I, I told my wife, Jackie, I said, you know, you would love it if we were able to go there, but we don't stand a snowball's chance in hell. <laughs> I mean, everybody I met had degrees up and down their arm. Um, and I just said, let's go ahead and plan the rest of our lives. And that was February, and then May, my, the week of my wife's birthday, I was on my way out to fly a test flight, and, um, and the phone rang in the ready room, duty officer said, hey, it's a call for you from Houston. And I said, I started to say, tell him I'll call back. <laughs> because I, I did not, not in my wildest dreams did I think, you know, I'd be getting a call to say, okay, you've been selected. Something said, no, I'll take the call. So I went back and, and I answered the phone. It was a man by the name of George Abbey, who, Mr. Abbey was the space program, the human space flight program. He was the director of flight cooperations. He made all the decisions, and we had been told when we left Houston, if you're selected, George will call. If you're not selected, it will be somebody else. Now, just because George calls doesn't mean you're selected. You know, they kind of split up everything because they're interviewing, I don't know, hundreds of people, and they're going to pick, in my class, they pick 19. And um, so it was George, and he said, hey, um, and he had this slow, almost like Fred. You, uh, you still want to be an astronaut? <laughs> and I said, yes, Mr. Abbey, I do. Uh, he said, well, you've been selected in the second class. I said, whoa. Uh, when, when do I need to be there? Next week? Tomorrow? He said, just calm down. He said, well, we got to notify everybody in the press, and we'll let you know. So he said, go about your business. Don't tell anybody except your wife. I'm on my way out to fly a test hop in an A7, which is a single 
engine airplane. My job that day was to jam the throttle back and forth to try to get the engine to fail. <laughs> and if the engine failed and I wasn't able to restart it, it meant I was going to have to jump out of this airplane, which had already been done earlier that year. And as I'm flying this test flight and I'm doing this, I said, you know, this is stupid. <laughs> I have just been called and told that I'm in the second group of space shuttle astronauts and I'm out here trying to get the dog on this thing <laughs> to fail, so I have to eject and maybe die. <laughs> Why am I doing this? But I flew the flight and went back and landed and went home and told Jackie. And uh, you know, we got we did get information that we should be there in July. That started my my time. We took our two kids. My son was I don't want to say fourth grade or third grade. My daughter um, was just a almost a baby. She was pre-K. And um, so we moved to Houston and stayed there for 14 years. Our kids grew up there, and we left after 14 years and four space shuttle missions um, the week after our daughter graduated from high school. And so we left. I went back to the Naval Academy because I'd been asked to come back to be the Deputy Commandant of Midshipman. So that was my foray into NASA, and I thought that would be it. You know, wouldn't see it again. We could be up here for hours, because these are great stories. But uh, we're, we're coming close to the ten. And there's two things I want to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, the first was your experience at NASA, and the second, just to let you know where I'm aiming at, is what it was like, you know, because you're rather publicly a person of faith. Yes. And what it was like both in the jobs as an astronaut and then running NASA, yeah. and how that influenced who you were, how you were accepted. I, I, am, I am a person of faith, and I make no qualms about it, but I am not a... I'm not a proselytizer, so I don't go out and say, hey, I'm a person of faith, follow me. Um, I, I'm not a anything like that. And I always relish the opportunity when somebody asks me about my faith, I'm quick to respond. And, um, you know, when I was the commanding general of the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing, after leaving the space program and before becoming the NASA administrator, we knew we were going, going to war in Iraq. We did, it, you know, the decision had not been made, but the decision had been made. And we could tell that, so we were making sure that our Marines were trained. And um, along with my staff, we decided that, you know, the one thing we were worried about was Marines being able to do their job. And we knew that if, if they were worried about their families back home, they would not be as effective as we wanted them to be. And we'd already started, we learned a lesson in Vietnam about family support. So we had a family support program. and. We emphasize that in, in, in the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. And, uh, but I had some of my young officers draw up what we call the campaign plan. And it was called Putting Marines First. And we had three tenets in the campaign plan. One was physical wellness for Marines, no sweat. They do that all the time. The other one was mental wellness. We were concerned about, we knew that when you get into combat, everybody's afraid if they're serious, you know, if they understand what's going on. And that's okay. And so we wanted to find a way to give them the mental strength to deal with that. And then the third one was spiritual wellness. And, and I thought that was important. We have the saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. True. <laughs> very, very true. Um, so the wing chaplain was assigned to put together a program to help develop our spiritual wellness. And, and the thing I wanted to do, because at the time, there was a lot of hatred for Muslims and everything. We had a lot of Muslims in the wing, and we had Jewish kids in the wing. We had people of all faiths, and we had people of no faith. And what I thought was really important was that the Marines understand that it didn't make any difference who was going to be next to them. That was another Marine, and it was your job to take care of them and let them take care of you. So with those three three things as a part of the campaign plan, we, you know, that's what we struck off to do. And um, so that was the first chance. And then when I got to NASA, it was sort of the same thing. People would frequently ask about my faith. Um, I had been very fortunate. We were stationed two years in Tokyo, Japan, and my, um, my equivalent, he was the equivalent of the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but he was my counterpart. Um, I was the deputy at U.S. Force of Japan. He was a person of faith, and uh, you know we did every quarter we did a joint trip where we went to see American and Japanese troops train together. But then we 
the, most of it was cultural stuff. And we went, I remember when we went back to his hometown and met his priest. It was a Shinto priest. And everything I heard them talk about was like I was back home in my church. <laughs> and I went, okay, what's with this? You know, and, but it turned out that it was a different way of worshiping a supreme being, but it was worshiping a supreme being. And, and that really helped me again. And so I've always been very quick to respond if somebody gives me the opportunity and asks me about my faith. And as a person, a person of science and engineering, I'm not a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but, but I'm connected to that kind of stuff. And people always ask, how can you uh, profess to be a person of faith and do this stuff that you're talking about exploring the universe? That's what's been so great about listening to all of you talk tonight, is because I, I always, my point is we are all living our lives on faith. Um, you know, very few of you scientists in here have concrete, irrefutable evidence that something is correct. Hubble Space Telescope disproved countless theories <laughs> from very smart people. Uh, James Webb will do the same thing. The observatory here will do the same thing. But we take stuff on faith based on a mountain of evidence. That's the way my religion is. I, I ask, I get challenged by, it, by evangelicals a lot about my faith and how can you how can you be a person that does science and still believes in all this stuff? And I said, okay, got a question for you. You ever meet Jesus? <laughs> and they kind of look at you and they go, no. I said, have you ever been to Bethlehem or Jerusalem? And they said, no. I said, well, I have. Um, and I didn't see him there either. I said, but I see him. <laughs> but I, as a person of faith, I see God and Jesus. I see it every day walking around the streets of D.C. I, I did a sermon a few weeks ago in my church, and I said, okay, this is going to be kind of controversial here. But my priest and I had talked about it at our, after one of our men's group meetings on Saturday morning. I said, I, I feel a little odd because we're old guys in this meeting, and we were talking about faith and other kinds of things, and it, it occurred to me that we always, I grew up in the South, and you always heard that, Hell was this hot, fiery place where bad people went. And heaven was this white, fluffy place where all the good people went, and you lived forever. And, I, and that just never made sense to me. I, I, and it still doesn't make sense to me. When I walk around every day and I see people who exemplify Jesus' teachings, uh, who may not have any money, and yet they find a way to help other people. Um, or I see people who have everything in the world and won't help anybody. So we see heaven and hell every day just walking around the street. But, but every day if we open our hearts and our minds, we see God's work in the people that, that are here. So, so I actually believe that we are blessed to be living in heaven here on earth if we only take advantage of it. You know, because I don't know that... If you're waiting to go to this place up in the sky, I've been in the sky. <laughs> and and that's, that's, that's a favorite question of people about astronauts. Um, what was it like going to heaven? <laughs> I said, well, um, can't tell you. Because there is no place like you have in mind, you know, that's, that's up above the clouds and stuff like that. I, I live in heaven every day because the people with whom I associate and stuff like that. So that's my controversial thing for the night. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's a wrap for this podcast. The audio editor was myself, Bob Tremblay. The original video recording used for this podcast was posted on the Vatican Observatory's YouTube channel. You can listen to our other podcasts on multiple different platforms and read our posts on social media and on the web at vaticanobservatory.org. Clear skies, everyone. <laughs>